uh, campaign volunteer coordinator and candidate. Uh, my name is Gary Carnes. I'm involved with the Center for Change. If you haven't been here before, um, this is the hub of the resistance in 2017. <laughs> and we've had, I took it off the wall, but you, you know how many rallies, protests, and marches were here in Monterey County. And a lot of them are staged out of this office. I'm going to open another office in Salinas in April. Uh, in a normal election year, 2016, one little fact most people don't know is we made 40,000 calls out of here to swing districts throughout the country here. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a candidate today who uh, is uh, up for election and uh, he's going to tell us more about that. I want to make two quick announcements. Uh, do sign in, if you didn't, to keep in touch with the coordinated campaign that's going to start soon. And that includes swing districts and local races, district attorney, Board of Supervisors, etc. Also, two quick announcements. People ask about the March for Our Lives. There's a sign-making party here tonight from 5 to 7. We have material to make signs. Uh, the event itself is on the 24th at Window on the Bay. I think it starts a lot. Um, also, the other announcement, we there's a petition circulating to uh, to buy up our uh, private water company, okay. Major Public, and Hugo Perlito here has a, a, um, a petition if you haven't signed. So having said that, I'm going to introduce Isenia Castillo, who is the volunteer coordinator for next congressman in Congressional District 22, Andrew Jans. Come on in. But just to introduce him, I like to, I want to start off with a story of how I first met Andrew. Um, so I was interning with a senator in Fresno. And, um, Tell him who? Senator Kamala Harris. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, you know, his campaign manager, Heather, got in touch with me. And we were all set to have an interview for you know, how I could be involved in the campaign. And so I, you know, great, you know. Put that in the back of my mind, went to work at the office uh, for the senator. And then I walk in and I see Andrew there. And I immediately am just taken completely by surprise. Uh, you know, he introduces himself to me very confidently. He says, Hi, I'm Andrew Jams, I'm running for Congress. And then right off the bat, he just starts asking me questions, you know, oh, you know, tell me about your first campaign. And, you know, it felt like an interview just on the spot. Uh, <laughs> it was very intimidating, but. Um, Something about that really resonated with me. Um, the fact that he came there himself to ask questions about me and to get to know me um, really made an impression on me. You know, he didn't send his campaign staffer. He didn't send uh, someone to represent him. He came himself. So that just kind of let me know that he's the kind of guy who isn't going to hide behind a desk, isn't going to hide behind his staff, isn't going to, you know, be the one that lets the staff take the, you know, take the fall. He's going to be the one who's always going to be the, uh, the responsible representative and always willing to be held accountable to uh, his constituents and to uh, his community. So it is my pleasure to introduce Andrew Jans. People working on our campaign and it reminds me of all the wonderful things that are going around all over all across the country uh, all across the Central Valley all across the state of California and I want to start off by thanking all of you for being here today um, I know that many of you are activists are heavily involved in uh, working campaigns um, and I've heard a little bit about what you've been doing uh, over the past few years and it's it's really exciting to see people uh, energized and focused on what is going to happen this year 2018 and I know that many of you take a lot of time uh, energy and resources away from your family and your jobs and sometimes that um, that work goes unnoticed and I just want to make sure that uh, on behalf of myself and others who are running all across the country thank you for your uh, volunteerism and activism 
and really bringing the fight to Republicans uh, all across the country. So thank you very much. So I really think and I wholeheartedly believe this, that uh, the efforts to defeat Devin Nunes, I don't have to tell you about all the uh, things that he's been engaged in over the past a year. Um, I think this race is probably one of the most important races in the country. Yes. And it's yes. one of the most important yes. uh, races in the country because Devin Nunes stands for everything that is wrong in Washington today. Yes. He is a Washington insider. He's been there for 15 years. He takes money from the biggest corporations on the planet. He is a Trump lapdog. And he isn't meeting with his constituents back home. And people hate that. And above all else, I think that the integrity of our democracy, the integrity of our criminal justice system is really under attack. And he is spearheading that effort. Him and Donald Trump, they're sidekicks in this. And uh, Paul Ryan isn't helping us out either. So we need to make sure that to, uh, to protect the integrity of the special counsel's uh, investigation, we need to make sure that we win back the House of Representatives. And that fight goes through California, and it goes through the So let me talk a little bit about myself. I think it's important that you know where I come from as a person um, because uh, when you're considering supporting somebody either financially or through your um, labor, uh, you've got to get to know that person. So I can tell you that uh, I come from a very simple background. Uh, my parents were both immigrants to the U.S. I grew up speaking English as a second language. Uh, my dad immigrated from northern Canada uh, and my mom from Thailand. My dad met my mom in Thailand when he was serving in the Peace Corps in the late 70s and early 1980s. So they got married, came to California, uh, and raised a family. And my dad worked in food processing plants up and down the Central Valley. Uh, my mom worked uh, minimum wage jobs at McDonald's, um, changing beds at the hospital. And they worked hard. They ta taught me the value of hard work. And it's something that I uh, keep in mind every day uh, in what I do. And I'm really a product of their upbringing. They saved up money for my brother and I to go to college. We both went to public schools. And um, I tell you this because uh, the person that I'm running against is a, a family that is born out of wealth. Nothing wrong with having wealth. Uh, but he's uh, um, a self-proclaimed dairy farmer. I honestly don't think that he's ever milked a cow in his life. <laughs> There's been an ongoing joke in the, in the district that uh, the only thing that he's milking are his constituents. So, so he, uh, he got involved in politics very early on and really had never worked. And uh, he ended up in Washington uh, as a 29-year-old congressman back in the uh, early 2000s. And he's been there for eight years. And he was interviewed uh, a couple weeks back by the Fresno Vita local paper. And they'd asked him, hey, what are some of your accomplishments? What are you most proud of? And his response was, well, I brought attention to the water issue in California. <laughs> and so we needed Devin Nunes to tell us that California has a water crisis. So, um, so that's sort of the theme of, of, of Devin Nunes' tenure in Washington. Uh, I come from a different place. I come from a place that, uh, that says that uh, we, we need to work hard for what you have. Uh, but at the same time, um, you have to focus on the people that you represent. So I'm very proud of my upbringing and, and my parents and, and how they raised me. And because of them, uh, I went from serving burgers at McDonald's in high school to now serving justice at the DA's office in Fresno. So I'm very proud of that. So I think that the fact that I'm a prosecutor provides a stark contrast to what we see in, in, in Devin Nunes. And uh, he's, he's right, he's been, he, this past year, he's been under a number of uh, ethics complaints. He was under an ethics investigation for the better part of last year. Um, and with Donald Trump in office, I think now more than ever we need real good people in government. My, my, my career tra trajectory was always to be a career prosecutor. Um, my friends and I are people who looked up to someone like Robert Mueller. Uh, I'm a registered Democrat. Robert Mueller is a registered Republican. Um, but we see honor and integrity and sort of the way that he's conducted himself over the years. And we see that now in Washington. And I thought that uh, after what after after what Nunes was doing, uh, with the secret trip to the White House and all that, I, I said, enough is enough. This is my congressman. It is my responsibility to step forward, and I did it. So... Oh. <laughs> 
for, for me stepping forward um, belongs to one man, and I think you all know him. He's a, he's a local. Uh, he is somebody that served in our armed forces. He is somebody that was elected to the House of Representatives. He is somebody that served as a White House Chief of Staff, somebody who was the Defense Secretary, CIA Director. Leon Panetta, uh, I was one of his students back in 2007 at his Public Policy Institute here. Um, and I remember being in his class and sort of, he sort of foreshadowed what was going to happen. And he really talked about ethics and morality and the need to have good people in government, the need to have bipartisan compromise in Congress. And uh, his, his mentorship and his lessons have stuck with me to, to today. And I wouldn't be the type of person that I am without his guidance and his, his leadership on, um, at his institute, him and his wife. His wife is also amazing, very strong, um, strong woman. Um, and so I'm, I'm involved in politics because of them and to a large degree. So let me say this. Uh, there are a number of pressing issues in the Central Valley, and uh, we are basically in your backyard. And uh, one of the issues that is most important to the Central Valley, as you all know, is uh, agriculture. And we are very proud of our agricultural heritage in the Central Valley. I know there's a lot of uh, agriculture and farming going on out here as well. Um, so I think that we're sort of brothers and sisters in that respect. And um, we're we're. The water issue is very complicated, um, and Devin Nunes has been promising to tackle this issue for a number of years. And uh, there are so many things that are going on with respect to water. Um, over the course of the past seven years, the drought has basically decimated our ground groundwater aquifers. And we need projects, and uh, we need a plan and a solution to move forward there. Uh, we also have a number of issues with respect to clean drinking water in many parts of our district. We have contaminated water where families, I've talked to families that um, have had to to bathe their children in bottled water because they can't use any of the water out of their taps. And nobody's talking about it. And it's really frustrating. So we're going to be out there, we're going to be talking about those issues that matter to folks. Um, one, of the, one of the frustrating things is when I talk to uh, independents and Republicans who we do need uh, to vote for us, um, they're not concerned at all about what's going on with the Russia investigation or what happened in 2016. And I think that a lot of you have probably seen that too with some of you have friends that are Republicans. They've totally ignored that issue. So uh, for me, it's important not only to uh, talk about the Russia issue, hold that and is accountable for that, uh, but also to make sure that, that, that the issues that people care about are addressed. Um, Nunes hasn't held, held town hall since 2010. Um, I've done a number of town halls. I did one a couple of days ago. It was very successful. We had Republicans and Democrats there. Yeah. And there wasn't a big problem. I mean, we sat down with adults and had a conversation. We disagreed on issues. We agreed on other issues. So my focus is going to be really to talk about the issues that really unite us. And I think this is something that we can, we can utilize all across the country. Uh, because I think the Republican playbook has traditionally been to really uh, divide us and to talk about the wedge issues that we know we can never come to an agreement on. So my, 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 my focus is going to be on the positive, to make sure that we talk about um, issues, bread and butter issues, like job growth, uh, economic development, and uh, that sort of thing. So I think, um, I've been in this race since April. And I think our message is starting to resonate. Uh, we're starting to get national attention for our race. Um, I'm getting invited to meetings with fine folks like you all over the state and all over the country. So um, I think it's really exciting. I think that uh, I said it's starting to resonate. Uh, in our recent poll, we closed within five points of Devonitas, which I think is absolutely huge. Oh, last challenger by about 35 points yeah, yeah. and uh, for us to be anywhere within single digits uh, eight to nine months out uh, I think is a very very uh, it's a strong positive and uh, we need to keep holding his feet to the fire and with the help of folks like you uh, all around the country I think we can do this I am confident that we can replace Devin Nunes because as I said at the beginning I think that our democracy is under attack mm -hmm. and the road to winning back the House of Representatives goes through California and in particular Devin Nunes' exactly. district. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. I am more than to answer any questions that you may have about our campaign, what we're doing, um, ways for you to get involved. Um, I'm at your uh, disposal. Yes? Sir, as you were saying, um, your district is very conservative. So what do you see being the best strategies for people on the ground to, uh, to help uh, lift this district? You know, um, I, I think that there's been, if you've been watching the news and the coverage of our race, mm -hmm. the, the consistent national narrative 
uh, is for folks like CNN to come to the district and interview uh, Devin Nunes supporters and then just leave town without talking to anybody that's really involved and engaged in what's going on on the ground. And it's really frustrating. And I can tell you that the district uh, has been added to the list of DCCC targeted uh, districts. We were added very early on, back in May. Um, what does that mean? Oh, so the, the DCCC is the Democratic um, Congressional Campaign Committee. They mm -hmm. target um, a number of races all across the country as races that are vital to moving the House issue. So gotcha. we're one of those races. Gotcha. Um, if you follow Pod Save America, they have a list of races, too, that they're, um, that they're focusing on. We were just added to their list recently. So uh, people are starting to understand that this isn't a strong Republican district anymore. And I can tell you that the trend over the past 12 years um, if you want to bear with me on numbers real quick, so Mitt Romney, uh, I'm sorry, uh, John McCain ran against Obama in 2008. He won the district by 60% uh, percent of the vote. 60%. Um, okay. Uh, Mitt Romney won by 56% percent of the vote. Donald Trump won last year by 52% percent of the vote. So it's trending in the right direction. So if he's only getting 52% percent of the vote, we're within striking distance. We've uh, had a recent poll out that puts uh, Trump's approval rating uh, in the mid-40s. So, um, so, so this is no longer a safe Republican seat. Um, I don't talk about it with the media much because I want Devin Nunes to think that this is a safe seat for him too. Right. Because while we're while we're working very hard to go door to door, um, he doesn't have a ground game. And the Republican playbook is to run ads and say that I'm a San Francisco liberal that didn't grow up in the district, which is completely not true. Um, I am a liberal, but I'm, I'm just saying I did grow up in the district. <laughs> Homegrown liberal. So, um, so, so I, I think the challenge is to to connect with people who have traditionally voted Republican. I know a lot of Republicans that I've talked to like the fact that I'm a prosecutor. Uh, a lot of people are actually shocked that a prosecutor can be a Democrat. So, it's a it's a real education effort. Um, one of the things that's really resonating with uh, farmers in particular who hold a lot of um, power and influence in the region is the fact that Donald Trump is now trying to engage the rest of the world in a trade war, which will decimate our agricultural industry in the Central Valley. That we're going to have China's all, or countries all over the world, like China, uh, imposing tariffs on our goods and our produce and our vegetables, uh, almonds and uh, raisins and grapes and all those types of things. So, so um, we're, we're really talking to Republicans and telling them that uh, Devin Nunes and Donald Trump are not your friends, and they're hurting your pocketbooks. Fine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. What is the solution to the water issue there? Uh, it is so complicated. Uh, <laughs> as you all know, water is probably the single most um, difficult issue in California to address. It's really uh, important in your district. It absolutely is. And yeah, so um, so I think one of the things that we have to do in the Central Valley, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is to um, refill our ground ground aquifers. And uh, last year, we had a wonderful, great rainfall year, and uh, there wasn't enough storage to keep all that water. And that water was sent out to the ocean, uh, billions of gallons of water, and um, millions of uh, acres uh, acre square feet. Um, we need to increase water storage, and I think that's a solution for the Central Valley that works for us. Um, I think that there are a number of environmental issues related to creating um, water storage. I think that those issues can be addressed. There are a number of pieces of legislation pending um, in the state legislature have been proposed in the past that I have supported. Um, but I think that the, the best way and the most immediate best solution is to capture that water. And there's a proposal that I'm supporting that will increase uh, the storage that we have now by, um, uh, by uh, three times, basically, uh, three times the amount of water storage we have now. Uh, that's one that I'm supporting. And I think that there's a, that there's a plan underneath that that will allow us to um, send the water to where we need to replenish sort of the ground aquifers that we have. Uh, the trick is to get everybody on board. Um, there's a water bond that's going to be on the ballot, I think, in November. And it's something that's supported by environmentalists and uh, folks in agriculture, and it's something that I'm supporting too. And there's a number of uh, initiatives underneath that water bond that I think that will do go a long way for the Central Valley. And um, I don't know how it affects you all out here on the, on the coast, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's quite different. A, quite a bit. Uh, Bob? Yeah. Yes, can you tell us how we can help you get out the vote? You said you want to take this one? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so uh, yes, yeah, so we actually just, I have here a lovely 
lovely stack of um, address lists for postcards to voters. So if any of you are interested, maybe I can pass these around. And um, what it contains is just, uh, it's all the same, even though they're different colors. We like diversity here on this campaign. <laughs> <laughs> and so what it is is just uh, a little uh, instruction kind of a guide. It is a sample script and uh, what it, and then uh, there's a short little address list for you all and then uh, an in-kind contribution form. So if you buy any postcards or stamps with the intention of utilizing them for the campaign, um, you would need to fill out one of those forms and mail it back or fax it, you know, take a picture of it, email it, all that good stuff. Um, so I'll just pass these around if any of you are interested. And there's another way that we can help here uh, from the Central Coast to the Central Valley, um, and that is a, a campaign um, like Andrew's running does not rely on corporations, does not rely on big money. He will not accept it. He's already said that he will not accept that. It depends on people like us. Mm -hmm. So if you have $5, $50, $500, we'll take it all, <laughs> whatever you want. Um, and we have these envelopes. If, if you'd like, we can pass them out now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're not obliged, but we would love it if you did. And uh, aside from the postcards and from donating, um, there's plenty of other ways to get involved. So around mid-March, so later this month, beginning of April, we'll be really starting to begin our ground game. So walking precincts. So if any of you are interested in uh, driving over to the district for a day, for a weekend, to help us walk a precinct or two, uh, we'd be more than happy to accommodate you all the best way we can. Um, a lot of our you know, fellow volunteers at Central Valley Indivisible have been generous enough to offer up their homes for anyone who is willing to, to come over and walk some precincts. Um, other ways to get involved without having to leave your home is with the postcards and then with online phone banking. Mm -hmm. So then I would, that includes just me sending you all a link and you would be provided with an online phone list. It's not an automatic dial system, so you would just be given a number and uh, you know you just dial the number that you see on the screen and there's a script on the screen and response codes and everything you need. Uh, so I can send you all the link for that if that's what interests you. Yes? Will you use our, that sign-in sheet to get in contact? Yes, so I have a sign-in sheet that I can also pass around. Yeah. yeah. Um, and here it just has different ways to get involved. So mm -hmm. instead of you having to email me and me email you back, I just, you know, I can just read this and see, you know, send you all emails right away with everything you guys need to, to get going. So I'll also pass uh, this around. I think she was taking over the sign-in sheet. There's yeah. also another reason. Oh, 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 yeah. yeah. There. Has everyone signed in here? Because we can just make copies. Yeah, yeah. I have a okay. Alright, then yeah, we can look at questions. So it occurs to me that if uh, the Russian invasion of our democracy was not made to stop, and that the Russians would love to see deadly units continue as the chair of the House Intelligence Committee for the yes. job that he's been doing to protect them. Yes. So um, what, recognizing that, I would think your campaign needs to be vigilant about cybersecurity. Because the mm -hmm. DCCC or, or what we could do to help in that regard. None of us would probably know how to do that. But yeah. It seems to me it's a big concern. It is definitely a big concern, and if you've been paying attention to what Devin has been tweeting, uh, he had encouraged actually Russian bots to help assist him in uh, aiding his campaign publicly. Um, so, so it's something that we're very uh, cognizant of, and uh, we have hired a number of um, consultants that are working to help us address the issue. But, um, <clears throat> you know, yeah, it's, it's something that we're paying attention to. I'm working very closely with the county clerk uh, to make sure that um, our voting systems are secure and, and operational. Uh, I think that the biggest threat, though, is through social media and all the stuff the Russian boss are going to say about me that aren't true. So. I think part of the the part of the challenge is to be able to raise the resources necessary for me to tell my story before the Russian bots or Devin Nunes tells it for me. Yeah. Um, and we've been very successful, um, even though we're not taking any corporate money. Um, and I want to make sure that we set an example for other candidates all across the country because we've been raising a ton of money without taking any corporate money. So if we can do it, I think everybody else can do it too. Yes, sir. I can't speak for everybody here, but I think I speak for most. Uh, I'm a retired teacher as well as a retired military and a gun owner, but I'm sick and tired of thoughts and prayers. What is your position on enacting good, strong, sensible gun control laws still within the Second Amendment? 
Yeah, I'm going to call the second amendment if people don't know how to start. Yeah. So I can tell you as a... I just had a comment about that if I can make it. Sure. I suggested a whole bunch of people we should see guns like cars. Licensed, registered, insured, and owners and users should pass tests to show you how to use these toilet safety. Yeah, I, I definitely support looking into that. Um, you know, as a prosecutor, I'm on the violent crimes unit, so I see the impact of gun violence on a daily oh, basis. Yeah. And in Fresno, we have a major crime problem. And we have about a shoot or gun-related crime. It's 1.5 gun-related crimes uh, per day that occur in Fresno oh, County. Wow. And I can tell you that in January, we took hundreds of guns off the streets, and this is just in one month. And um, many of these guns belong to, at some point, a lawful gun owner who didn't properly store their weapon. So that is something that I think that we need to have as well, a conversation about proper uh, gun responsibility. I think that people who um, allow guns to fall into the hands of, of, of criminals uh, by not um, storing them properly, I think they should be held accountable too. So uh, I can tell you that I support uh, the assault weapons ban. I think we need to revisit that. I don't think that it should never have lapsed. I think there should be more guns added to the list because I think there were some guns that weren't on the list that should have been on there. Uh, and there were probably some guns that are on the list that maybe should have been on there. And I'm also speaking uh, from the perspective of a gun owner. And I've owned firearms, and I don't think that the Second Amendment is without limitation. Um, I don't think there is a single Supreme Court case or circuit court case that says that assault weapons are protected under the Second Amendment. So when you have the NRA and when you have people that are funded in Congress by the NRA go out there and say that assault weapons are protected by the Second Amendment, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so I think that we need to do all the basic things that everybody's been talking about. We need to raise the age to 21. We need to have universal background checks. I think that's very important to me as a prosecutor. I need to be able to look across state lines and see who owns what type of firearms, uh, who's getting better for what. Uh, I think all of those things are important, and I support uh, each and every one of those um, initiatives. Yes? I know what will convince your constituents uh, most easily is an in-depth knowledge of the water problem. And I'm looking for ways to learn about it. So uh, I'm going to just suggest that maybe on your website or something, you that might have a list of resources to uh, appoint um, whoever's coming for me uh, about you? water problems in okay. the valley and, okay. and some of the ongoing legislation that the um, is Cindy on our phone banking script? Do we have um, language about water? Or? Yes, there on, so on the link that I will send you, it will redirect you to a web page where there are helpful talking points. And it has uh, Andrew's stance on water, uh, LGBTQ rights, and immigration, and all these other issues that you could use when you're talking with your voters. Okay. Thank you. It's on the website? Yes. Sure. Uh, that was actually going to be my question with the ICE that you mentioned being a um, sister district. Uh, wh what kind of activity is going on with ICE and what do you think about It's the about same thing that you guys are seeing out here. Uh, there were a number of ICE raids this past week up and down the valley and they're going after folks that work in food processing plants. And I think personally that it's, a, it's an attack by the Trump administration and ICE on California. It's retaliation yes. for us being a sanctuary state. Um, and the way that I've been talking to Republicans and farm owners about this is it's an attack on agribusiness because they yeah. don't have the labor that they need. And they're having trouble recruiting people to work the fields, and I think this exacerbates the problem. So this is hitting them in their pocketbooks, it's hitting Republicans in their pocketbook, pocketbooks. When they go to buy produce and vegetables and other things and they see the cost of food going up, uh, this all, this hurts the economy. So what I've been talking about is making sure that um, that ICE, as a prosecutor, that ICE isn't in our um, in our jails. They're not in our schools. They're not in our courthouses and things like that. Um, and I think it's been very productive for me to talk about it because, as I said before, many people didn't think that you could have a prosecutor who was a Democrat. So when I talk about this from a law and order perspective, I think it resonates with folks who, who traditionally don't vote Democrat. Um, and the other the other way that I talk about the issue is as a prosecutor again, is when I go out and try to prosecute a crime, uh, many times, specifically in the Central Valley, these communities are targeted uh, disproportionately by criminals because they know that these folks won't report the crime. Um, and then I try to go prosecute the crime, uh, folks don't show up to court. I send out a subpoena, they don't show up because they don't know if they're gonna be deported or their family's gonna be deported, that sort of thing. So 
Um, I think that it's bad for our economy, and I think it's bad for our criminal justice system. So I've been very vocal about that. As, as a follow-up to that, do you think um, it would be helpful if uh, cities became sanctuary cities, even though we're already a sanctuary state, but even like doing like a cop watch of the feds kidnapping people? Uh, I think I think that lawmakers in cities um, should. Uh, I think that should be left up to each city on an individual basis, see what they want to do. Um, I know that there are many folks in this room that have been uh, very. Um, been working very hard on the rapid response program. I think we need programs like that all around the state. I think that's probably the best way to go about it. Because I don't trust uh, I don't trust our politicians on city council, especially in, 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 in the Central Valley, to do the right thing. So I think that it's up to us and incumbent upon good people like us to make sure that these communities are protected. Um, I'm just wondering from a legal standpoint, and since I'm not a lawyer, I don't play one on TV. Um, I, um, is this, does, does the, Idea, the idea of declaring ourselves a sanctuary state, does that then fall into states' rights? Um, and that the federal government is trying to force itself to have a state do what it wants when they're always arguing for states' rights? Yes. I, I think this is a complicated constitutional law question because then you're talking about the role of the federal government, which I think they do have a role in immigration. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And the states. States do also have uh, a role to play with respect to um, uh, immigration. So, but when they've taken I, it too far, um, yeah, I, as, I, I I don't know. I, yeah, I wouldn't okay. want to be. I wouldn't want to give a, a legal opinion that would turn out to be no. a, <laughs> a big part of the uh, Russian bots program uh, seems to have uh, achieved uh, a suppressed turnout among voters uh, in 2016. Uh, can you do anything to counter that? And do you have any plans to? focus on voter turnout. Yeah, I think that um, a major component of our campaign is voter turnout. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, it's about uh, being able to go out there not only uh, on the ground, but uh, on the airwaves and on social media to talk about uh, who I am as a person. Because I think for a lot of people, the first impression is the most important um, impression. And they they will size you up in, in five minutes. And so if I'm able to go out there and be able to explain who I am as a person uh, before these Russian bots come in and sort of lie about who I am, I think uh, that's sort of the, the way that I want to run the campaign. Um, the, the best way for us to be able to combat that narrative is to, to raise the money and resources necessary to go out there and, and do these types of things. As a related question, as a prosecutor, can you do anything in Fresno County uh, to uh, try to protect against the Russian bot invasion? Um, <clears throat> I have to be very careful because I'm still a prosecutor and I still work at the DA's office um, and I can't be um, perceived as sort of using my position of power to influence an election. Um, so our team has been very careful about how we talk about uh, those issues. Um, because the other side, the other side will do it. Um, they don't care about ethics or or, 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 or the legal system, to be frank. Um, so I think that we need to make sure that our. I think this is more of a federal issue. So I think that uh, it's needed to come in on the FBI and, and those folks to do it. Um, what's really disappointing for me is that I, I do have the opportunity of working with some of the men and women over at the FBI, and I can tell you that they're hardworking uh, men and women that are just trying to get to the bottom of what happened in 2016 and. And even in other cases that I've had an opportunity to work with them on. So um, I'm really disappointed in specifically my opponent's uh, continual attacks on law enforcement. Uh, from a federal standpoint, I mean, we're going to have we're going to have a number of serious cases that come out over the next couple of years. And when you have half the population who thinks that the FBI is some sort of you know deep state. Uh, 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 I don't know what you want to call it, but you know they're 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 really undermining our criminal justice system, which I think is the problem. Um, so we need a concerted effort to go out there and, and try to fight that narrative. Have you given any thought to arresting Yes. I'm sure he has thought about arresting me. I was in Salinas two weeks ago at a meeting that Representative Panetta had with the ag uh, industry, and uh, basically asking them what are some of the things that are really important for them to continue on with the level of productivity this thing has. 
the number one thing that came up was labor availability, yeah. and they were pushing for guest worker jobs. But this is something that they thought was going to be essential because the worker needs that they see going forward can't be met with the current situation. Yeah, um, I know that a lot of Republicans support the guest worker program. A lot of farmers support the guest worker program. Um, you know, my approach is to have a comprehensive approach. I think that we need to talk about, you know, I, I, we need to talk about pathway to citizenship. I think that that is probably the best way to go about it. Um, but with that being said, I don't think that we're going to be able to pass any type of, even if we went back to the House and even if we went back to the Senate, we're not going to be able to pass any type of meaningful um, immigration legislation, I don't think, without some votes from moderate Republicans. So I'm willing to work with those folks on, on, on some issues, but um, but I think I think my my approach would be path to the citizenship. Yes, sir. A uh, chain this they they're calling it chain immigration well, seems to be an issue with the uh, with the Republicans. And uh, just to me it seems like it might be a little unfair to give a group of people entree to the country just because they've already had the entree. It seems like it'd be better to have a broader yeah, I think, uh, I mean, Trump is definitely an expert on that because I don't think that Melania's parents would be able to be here. <laughs> that type of thing. Um, yeah, I'm willing to look at it. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what, um, I, I, I don't know what would be fair. So it's something I'm looking at. It's been this way for centuries, though, has it not? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what, what, I think what Trump is trying to do is somehow connect some of the, uh, the terrorism that we've seen out there with like you know we're letting folks in so and it's totally you know most of the most of the mass shootings and, and domestic terrorism occur from people that are lawful legal citizens so it's, um, I think he's just trying to play games sure um, I'll start with the marijuana issue I've been a proponent of legalizing cannabis uh, and marijuana for since I've been in college um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I can tell you as a prosecutor, uh, we're, we're putting too many people in we're putting too many people in prison that don't belong there. And I I prosecute violent crimes, I prosecute the people that should be in prison, and they're getting released early because the jails and prisons are taken up by folks who don't really belong there. So I think that we need to, from a federal standpoint, uh, revisit the uh, making uh, cannabis now on schedule. It, it should be schedule one drug. Um, we need to look at the federal sentencing guidelines. I think they're completely out of whack. Uh, with respect to the opioid crisis, this is a tough issue. I mean, we need we need um, a federal response to this because people are are killing themselves all across the country, and um, and the death toll is staggering. You know, I was in I was in uh, Pennsylvania not too long ago for a conference for prosecutors. And they took us to their morgue, and there's a person coming in every single day. This is in Pittsburgh, a person a day uh, that is overdosed, and uh, it's 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 very sad to see. And I think that it really goes back to, for me, I think our country just needs to have a conversation about our national priorities. There's a number of things that we can do, and one of the things that I've been talking about is investing in early childhood development. I think that, uh, I see the shirt back there, I mean, we need to talk about whether or not we're gonna be building preschools or prisons, because yes. if yeah. you get to these kids, if you get to these kids between um, conception and uh, preschool, there is an exponential amount of impact that you can have on their brain development. And this goes to work against uh, many of the societal problems that we see today, um, including drug abuse, homelessness, uh, criminal activity, all of the above. Um, so I think that would be my long-term approach to the problem because I think if we just, you know, say that this is a mental health issue or a drug issue, we're sort of we're sort of trying to put out the fire, um, you know, on the back end when we could be preventing the fire to begin with. So I think that we need to have a national conversation about how we spend our money as a society. I think we need to look at military spending. We spend a crazy amount of money on military spending. We don't need this type of military spending. And the Republican, I'll get you, the Republican attack line, um, it, you know, when I talk about uh, reducing military spending is, oh, you're not in favor of the troops. And we know that a uh, vast majority of this money doesn't go to the average soldier that serves on the front lines. It goes to the military industrial complex. So, yeah, it doesn't go to the veteran guy. We're not taking care of our veterans. So we need to make sure that our spending priorities are in line. Uh, I think that one of the best things that we can do uh, when we get the house back is to repeal the Trump tax plan that they put into place. Yeah. 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 It's a pretext for that.
the other little social programs that we need to be a society that we all want to live in. So um, I think that's one of the first things that we should do. Uh, and I think a lot of people support it. Yeah. Yes, sir, in the back. But, uh, two, two things, there's a couple of points that have been brought up so far. One is uh, about guns and the fact that we don't go after the manufacturers, and the manufacturers are the only people that are exempt from being sued as a group in our yeah. entire country. That's yes. number one. And number two is the privatization of prisons. And the fact that the justice system has become a, a profit place, quote unquote justice system, has become a profit place for people who are building prisons and they are as culpable for supporting um, Republican um, elected officials as anybody else is. So how do we do this? How do we unwind this stuff? Yeah. Uh, Going back to the, um, you know, I think that gun manufacturers should be held accountable just like car manufacturers are. Absolutely. So I yeah, think we need absolutely. to eliminate that, that uh, ability not to sue them. Uh, with respect to private prisons, I think the ACLU is doing a really good job. They have this new program where we go after uh, elected officials who are DAs. Um, I can tell you that my DA is a pretty moderate DA in Fresno County, and um, I think that's one way to go about it. If you have if you have DAs that are taking money from the private prison industry, I think that's a huge problem. Oh, I think they should be precluded from doing that because that is a major conflict of interest. And you're going to be sending people to prison and you're going to be profiting from it. I think that's a big no-no. So I think I think the ACLU is doing a good job. I support their effort in making sure that there's accountability with respect to elected district attorneys. Um, but uh, but I'm 100% I'm with you. We need to make sure that private prisons aren't out there because the criminal justice system is about um, it's about rehabilitation and it's about keeping our community safe. And I don't think private prisons does anything to address any of those issues or promote any of those goals. Yes, can you talk a little bit about your views on uh, the women's movement, Me Too, and how it's impacting your area? Absolutely. Um, I am uh, disappointed that my wife wasn't able to make the trip with me uh, today. She was actually one of the key organizers for our Women's March in Fresno. Mm -hmm. And she uh, she's an amazing woman. She's involved heavily in the community. And she does, she's a marriage and family therapist. So she does and handles a lot of cases uh, with respect to women who have been abused by men and that sort of thing. So she's been a profound influence on me uh, in my life and on my campaign as well. Um, the Me Too movement is something that I think is pretty personal for me. Uh, one of the most high profile cases I've handled was basically a Me Too case where a man uh, assaulted a woman uh, who told him no. And he wouldn't take no for an answer. And this was a local model. She had a cocktail glass smashed on her face by this man. And this is a bit of a prominent businessman in Fresno. Uh, it was his. Believe it or not, it was his third strike, so he's now serving uh, life in prison because we can make him so I, think that, uh, I think that there's a concerted effort by folks on the right to silence women. I think that whenever you see uh, some of these abuses, and I think the White House is a perfect example of this, you see Rob Porter, you know, one of the key folks working in the Trump administration, being protected by the Chief of Staff and the President of the United States, basically saying that women shouldn't be heard, and basically questioning everything that uh, women stand for. You know, in, in, in my office, when a woman comes forward, and it doesn't even have to be a woman, it could be a man, when they come forward and they tell us that they've been assaulted, you know, it's my obligation to figure out what happened, and, you know, my first inclination is to believe them. You know, there are people out there that make up stuff, I agree with that, uh, but, you know, you have to do a thorough investigation, but I think you have to start from the point that they've come forward for a reason, and you investigate the crime, and you don't discredit them before due process has been um, uh, been handed out. So I think that uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see the Me Too movement um, spring up, and women are now proud uh, and not afraid anymore to come forward and, and, and explain some of the things that, they've been, that, that have been happening to them. Um, you know, I think it's starting to resonate. We see in the California legislature, they're putting in some uh, some provisions that protect some of the female staffers that work up uh, in Sacramento. So I think that we need to implement a lot more of these laws in, in our workplaces. I think uh, sexual harassment training is very important, believe it or not. Um, not all companies and not all um, agencies have sexual harassment training or, or, or take it seriously. So I think those are other things that we can do as well. Yes, turn the back. Yeah, a couple of real quick comments here. Uh, I think uh, private prisons is a, is a terrible thing because 
private prisons are in business to make money. It's not in their best interest to rehabilitate those folks. Do they want them coming back? They don't have prisoners, they don't make any money. A comment you might be able to use on the defense budget, uh, we don't spend too much on defense, we spend too much on offense. Yeah. That's true, that's true. Trump certainly does. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. We were going to yeah. yeah. have everyone kind of meet and kind of talk to you. Just break, break up and yeah. informally, but then Andrew has to get on the road in yeah. about 10 minutes. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah.